Hey there, this is Richard from the Men of the House podcast. I am part of the Podcast Connection Network, which is full of awesome shows such as the one you're about to listen to. We have a world of podcasts that'll keep you hooked. Head on over to our webpage, which you will find the link for in this episode's description. Enjoy. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Men of the House podcast. On today's episode, we have Alan Meisner and in this episode, we are going to talk to, we're going to talk about fitness over 40. And I believe he has a podcast called 40 plus fitness. Is it, is that correct? I, yeah, that's it. 40 plus fitness. Well, how are you doing today, Alan? I'm doing really well, Rich. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. So kind of what, you know, where I start off with every guest is I want to get a little bit of your background. I want to know before you ended up in this fitness space that you're in with a podcast. Where were you and kind of what was the catalyst that got you to here sitting in front of me? Whatever it was that initially caused you to embark on this journey. And I know we were discussing before, you had a little bit of space in between the embarking on the journey and actually, let's say, get down to the nitty gritty and commitment to the journey because there is a difference in deciding to embark and taking off and then being committed where there is no looking back. So in, in, in the South, in the South, we call it fixing to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> where in the South are you from? I, I well, I, I, I grew up most of my, uh, teenage years in Mississippi. So yeah, if you go to Mississippi, you'll hear them say, I'm fixing to do this. I'm fixing to do that. And, and so, yeah, there was a lot of fixing to that went on in my life. Oh, I was stationed I in Meridian, started. Mississippi in the nineties. So okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So not too far. Uh, Southern Miss, I went to Southern Miss. It's about uh, 90 minutes South of Meridian. So yeah, you're in the neighborhood. But uh, so no, I, um, I, I was, I was the guy who focused on his career and got it all done. You know, uh, you, you talk about the American dream and the American dream is, you know, you go to college and you get this job and you grind your way up the corporate ladder and then you find yourself, you know, up at the top, you know? And so I was C-suite at 39 years old in a oh. fortune 500 company. So that was not a small feat particularly since I did the job, nobody liked, I was the internal auditor. And so, no, I'm not an IRS auditor. Don't panic. Um, <laughs> I was an auditor inside a company. I mean, I was the guy, if someone was coming and checking, checking stuff out to make sure you're doing the things they're supposed to do. I was that guy. If someone did something wrong and needed it all investigated and reverse engineered, how did he do this? How do you take the money? how did they do that? I was that guy. And I was exceptionally good at that job. And I was, pretty decent at managing people and helping people, coaching people, doing things. So I progressed up the career ladder pretty quick. Plus I was the guy who would do and go anywhere. I mean, so it, it didn't matter whatever needed to get done. I was the guy who would do it. And so I got my way up the career ladder really, really quick. The only problem with that was I didn't do anything else in my life. Well, uh, I didn't take care of myself. I didn't eat well. I didn't exercise. I didn't have good relationships over time. If you don't have a good relationship, your whole life gets toxic. And so I just dealt with toxic at work. I dealt with toxic at home and I just become normal, just normal. You know, not my girlfriend doesn't like me. I don't care. You know, it's fine. We're, we'll just keep doing it. You get the C-suite attitude of like, Hey, you know? uh, I'm not, I'm here to make money. I'm not here to make friends. I, you exactly. know, I had, well, I was in a career. I could not have friends at work because then that mean people would think that I was being impartial, right? you know, and, and, and you know, being partial and not impartial and that I was not objective. And so I was like, okay, I can't be seen as being friendly with people at work so much, you know, like, yes, if everybody's together in a group function, I could go. But if it was just like a, Hey, let's hang out and go have a beer. It's like, I don't know that I want to do that. And then the other side is if we're in town and I meet someone and they know you, like, I can't be friends with them either. Mm -hmm. Cause if they start to say something and I'm like, such and such, such, such and such. And I'm like, crap, you know, now I've got to report him and I don't want to report him. He shouldn't be talking about this stuff outside of work. And, and so again, it was just, just a very tense, stressful. Well, how did you awful. find your way into that? I mean, I know like just like well, myself, there's a way to get kind of caught up in this 
what we think is the American dream. And there's an allure to that, like rising to the top, climbing the corporate ladder, the money, the benefits, the prestige that kind of comes along with a C-suite title and all that. So I know the allure was something different in the beginning, but you know, I guess, how does one find their way into a job that nobody else wants that is so isolating? What? How did you find out that was either your skill set, you were good at it, or was it something you actively pursued? Well, initially I went into accounting and audit because I knew accounting was the language of business. And okay, if I know accounting, I can pivot that to practically anything in business. Uh, it's the top level business thing you can do. You know, people who can't make it in accounting become marketers. That that was kind of the joke at school. Uh, we had a very good marketing program. We had a very good accounting program. We had a very good marketing program. It was like everybody who couldn't make it in accounting went to marketing. And so I I I was I was good at it. And then when I got my my into the job, I found out I was pretty much actually exceptional at it. I could do a lot of it, and it's like it was a system and you know, I majored in physics when I first went to school. Physics is systems, okay? Programming is systems. So all the things that that were high-level thought were systems, and this was just, this was the same. So I can see what's there and what's not there. It's just, a, it was just a skill set. Now, once I got into the job and I started realizing, okay, it's, it's also personality and politics, I learned that system pretty quick. <laughs> And so I knew how to say, okay, when I'm having a conversation with this person, I talk this way. And then when I'm talking to that person, I can say this. And so as I worked my way through, I ended up in really incredible situations. Okay. Um, not many auditors out there can say they worked for a company that was delisted from NASDAQ because of a financial fraud that they identified. I did. <laughs> And so that was the whole point. The company I was in, it was a Fortune 500 company. When I started with them, I was hired as a vice president. And when I made my decision that I was going to try to fix myself, that was right after I identified that significant accounting fraud and that company is gone. They got delisted from, NAS from the New York Stock Exchange. All the stuff you hear about, about the attorneys coming down from Washington, D.C. and scrubbing all the data and pulling all the hard drives and all the, like the raids, like an FBI raid. This is attorneys coming in and raiding our offices. I coordinated all of that. <laughs> I was wow. the only human being on earth that knew nine attorneys were going to show up at our office at nine o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday morning. Only human being on earth other than them that knew that this was about to happen. And I, I needed it to be that way because if the CEO, CFO, CMO, or general counsel knew it was going to happen and they deleted anything, they would be seen as guilty. Mm -hmm. So they couldn't know. Nobody could know that this was going to happen. And so I had to keep that, that information in my head for three weeks and not say yeah. a word. Okay. Uh, so it was, it was, it was stressful, but I was good at it. I was actually very good at it. I could, I could, I could do the work. And so because I was good at it, I got promoted. I moved up. I did the things I got where I needed to be, but unfortunately I gave up everything else, literally everything else that makes us man, makes us human. And so I was sitting on the beach, this, this whole episode thing had just sort of gone through. And at this point, I know there's going to be this major investigation. I know all of this stuff's going down. And I just told myself, I was like, look, I, three years in a row, I never took a vacation. And I'm like, I, I have to take a vacation. And so I took a vacation and I took a week off and I went to this time, the area, this, this resort and they had timeshare. And I'm like, ah, that's it. If I sign up for a timeshare and I've paid for a week, I'll take a week because I, I'm paying for it. And so I did that. I just went and bought the timeshare. I didn't care. I was like, okay, I'm pot invested. I'm going to take a vacation. That's my first, like kind of first step, you know? Okay. Now the problem was this was an all-inclusive resort that included the alcohol. And, you know, so again, what am I doing? I'm drinking my butt off for a week. And I went out there to try to play volleyball and I used to be really good at volleyball. So I'm like, oh, you know, I'll enjoy some volleyball. And I didn't, I almost didn't make it through the whole first game. And then I had to sub out. I'm like, I can't, I can't do this. And so I'm like 39 years old. And I, I'm like, I can't play volleyball. That's ridiculous. This, this is not man, you know, two man. This is six people on either side. It was like, just stand there bumping the ball. And, and so I was like, I, I've got to change. That was the decision. <laughs> now I made the decision 
on the second day I was there. Uh, but of course, it was all inclusive, alcohol included. So um, <laughs> what did I do? Well, I continued to relax. do what I did. Right. So I get back and I try something and it fails and I try this and I lose a little bit of weight and then I gain it all back and more. And now, are you still at the job it, when you come back from vacation? Yeah. Yeah. And okay. so I do all this stuff and I'm like, okay, I'm not getting anywhere, but I did that for eight years, like eight years of trying and failing, trying and failing, trying and failing. It was like being drug across the bottom of the ocean. People was like, when did you hit rock bottom? I'm like about age 39. And I stayed there until I was age 47, you know, wow. just being like, like I was connected to the anchor being drug across the bottom. And then this one thing happened. Well, two things happened. Okay. The first thing that happened was my daughter had gotten into CrossFit and she was a level one CrossFit coach and she was so excited about it. She's doing like these mud run things. She's doing all these little things. And she called me up and she said, daddy, I want you to come watch me do a CrossFit competition. And it, like that just hit me in the gut. And I was like, wait a minute, as, as the dad, I'm not supposed to be the spectator in my daughter's life. I should actually be doing that competition with her. And that should be the experience that should be the, the life experience that we have is that I'm doing the CrossFit competition with her, not watch her. Now I, I did go watch her to, so don't, don't be mad at me. Let's say I didn't go watch as I did. I did go watch my daughter do the competition, but as I was laying there, I was thinking, okay, what is wrong with me? Why have I been able to do all these hard, hard things? You know, CPA exam is hard and I did it. I was in the military and it was hard in infantry and it was hard and I did it. I ran an ultra marathon when I was 29 years old. It was hard, but I did it. Like, why, why was I able to do all of these hard things? But now I'm just here with this health and fitness thing. Why is this, why can't I do it? I can do hard things. And then it hit me. Every one of those other things I committed to. And when I say commitment, I mean, obsessive, nothing between me and it committed. So I started trying to do some training. I was doing a little bit of training and then I did a little, um, warrior dash. It's like a 5k mud run. It's kind of fun. And I was like, okay, I did that mud run. I'd been training for a, a few months. And I'm like, okay, I did the mud run. And then I realized, okay, I'm not moving fast enough. I'm not getting where I need to be. I need something big and scary in front of me. So I called up my daughter and I said, Hey, um, what do you think about doing a tough mudder? And she's like, really? And I'm like, yeah. So for those that don't know, a, a tough mudder is like a 12 to 13 mile mud run. Now, mud run is not like a normal run. Like, you know, normal half marathon is 13.1 miles. This is not on the road. This is not even a trail run. This is back where people take their trucks and four wheelers to get stuck. Oh, they wow. want to get stuck. You know, this is like, this is hard terrain. And so this is in hard terrain, wet and muddy. And they also throw in like 25 obstacles just to, you know, mess with you. Well, that sounds fun. Right. Well, it, it, yeah, but this was the first, this was the only, at that time, the only civilian obstacle course that someone had died doing. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> so this was, this was a push. I, I had no real business signing up for it, but I knew if I put myself between that scary thing and where I was, I, I would do the work. And what, what was and the so, choice for that? Like, so you, you did kind of the warrior dash, but kind of what made you pick that? Was it just the availability? It seemed kind of fun. It was, it was being scary. Uh, the warrior dash is a 5k. So we're talking about three miles yeah. versus 12. The warrior dash, if you, you know, the obstacles are not that hard. Uh, everybody helps each other on warrior dash. You know, that's kind of the thing is we're, we're all a team together. No one's there to win anything. There's no real competition to it. It's, it's, it's just basically, we're all out there having fun. Let's lift people up. Let's pull people up. Let's help them get through things. Uh, whereas the, uh, the tough mutter is looking to break you. <laughs> Not like the Spartan. Spartan will, the Spartan is definitely designed to break you, but the, the, the Tough Mudder is designed to really test 
a lot of different things. So sometimes it's fear of heights. Sometimes it's being confined. Sometimes it's electricity, uh, you know, cold. Uh, there's lots of things that you go through that it's intended to define something that you struggle with. Okay. And so that, that was, that was part of it. Plus just the distance, you know, at mm -hmm. the time the Spartans were that in, I didn't even know, I probably didn't even know about the Spartan at the time. I knew about the Tough Mudder. And I'm like, okay, this will this will push me. And so, yeah, I, I started training for the Tough Mudder and I lost 66 pounds of fat. I gained 11 pounds of muscle. Wow. Um, and Incredible. just completely converted my whole body to be able to do this because the, the concept in my head was not, like I said, it was not just doing it. Right. It was, I'm doing this with my daughter. My daughter is a superior athlete as a CrossFit level one coach. And she's fit as I was at her age. And so I don't want to slow her down. I don't want her to feel like she should, uh, you know, tell her, just go ahead and leave me. Um, you know, tell her bye, I love them. You know, I was, I, that was not what I had in my head. It was like, okay, no. I'm going to run with her, let her run her race and we finish this together. And so that was the mindset as I went into my training of this is who I'm going to be and this is what I'm going to do. And I did. And so at the end of the race, and this was so funny, uh, we're running and uh, we, we made good time. We were doing really good. And then we come up and the next to the last obstacle was electricity. Okay. And what they had was they had all these wires hanging down from a rack and you run through and it's wet and muddy and there's ruts. And so you're running, you can't just run because you got to watch the ruts. And then there's the stringers that are hanging down that are running electricity. And now what had happened was all these guys had seen their buddies run in there and get sapped and fall fa face first into the mud and then try to get up and get hit again and go down again. So you got like 25 guys standing in there, just looking at this obstacle, just terrified. How are we going to do this? What are we going to do? And, and I, 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 to my, we're running up on them and we can see them all there and we see the guys falling. And my daughter's like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Just, just run around them. She's like, what? Said, just run around that side, run around this. We ran around the two of them. And just before we got to the obstacle, I grasped her hand and we made it all the way through. We got shocked, but neither of us fell. We made it all the way through. And then we finished the Tough Mudder together, holding hands. Okay. That is awesome. Now, right. Now, for anyone that decides they want to do a Tough Mudder, let me give you a little tip. Um, again, like I said, I, I majored in physics. I think I said that. But, okay, the two bodies holding hands to play, displaces the electricity. So you're less likely to get knocked on your butt if you connect with other people and all go through together. Okay. Uh so there's your insider tip. That's awesome to kind of figure <laughs> that out. And I kind of had that in my brain whenever you yeah. initially said holding hands. And I was like, I guess maybe there's just not as much voltage because there's two pairs. Yeah, um, it, displaces, so more... it displaces the electricity and you're less likely to fall on your face. So, you know, it is what it is. And so were you 47 I... at this time of the Tough Mudder? Yeah, I, I, was, I was 47, yes. Okay, because I'm 47 now, so trying to put this all into perspective and man, so your mindset in order to lose that much fat and prepare for it, I'm guessing, you know, being an accountant, being a systems person, you're probably very methodical. And yes. so you came up with what a training regime, kind of a nutrition plan and all that. So well, the goal wasn't necessarily to lose the weight, but the goal was, Hey, I want to well, be fit enough to enjoy this thing with my daughter and kind of the byproduct of getting to that level was the yeah. weight loss and the fitness. Right. Cause a, a 275 pound man does not need to run 13 miles and do all this stuff. So for me, it was okay. I know I need to lose some weight. I know I need to improve my strength and I know I need to improve my stamina. So yes, my training was around that. Now here, here was my fundamental problem. 
I still had a job. And so I wasn't able to train like a professional athlete. I still had to do the, the thing. And I traveled at that point about 90% of the time. And so I was like, okay, I need some guidance. I need some help. When you travel 90% of the time, that means you're home about one weekend a month. So you, you can't hire a personal trainer because that doesn't work at the time. You couldn't hire a personal trainer because they want to meet with you in person two or three times a week. And I, that didn't work. I, I, I wanted to do certain things, but I, you know, like, I'm not going to be in my home gym every day. I'm going to be around the world. And so what it meant was I had to figure out how I was going to do this. There were no books. There was, there were two books. Okay. Two types of books. When I went out there looking for books for people over 40 and that was chair yoga and stretching. Okay. Mm. But those two, those, those are important. Don't get me wrong. And they're great, but they were not going to help me do a tough mutter. Correct. I can't yoga my way. Can't <laughs> yoga my way through a tough mutter. And and then I was like, oh, I'll look at podcasts. There were no podcasts in the health and fitness field for anyone over the age of forty. Hmm. And so I'm like, this is ridiculous. I guess I will become my own coach. So that's when I started working on the certifications. So. I started working, I, I went with the National Academy of Sports Medicine, got their textbooks, went through the program, said, okay, from this, I know I need, I know my movement patterns are off. I need some corrective exercise. Um, I looked at the Functional Aging Institute, you know, and I, and I did theirs. I looked at uh, fitness nutrition and I did theirs. So basically I made myself my own personal trainer. I would not advise that anyone else try to do that because one, it takes a lot of dedication that when I'm spending time training and I'm spending time learning and doing these things and then doing it for myself, when you can just hire that out. And like for today, all the listeners, the NASM training exam is not easy. I had to take no. it as a trainer at Gold's. I ended up having to take it twice because I'd taken a little time off in between kind of school and where I was, and let's say how up to date I was on the learning process. But it's a lot of information. Not only is it, you know, it's, it, you know, it's kind of expensive, but relative, but yeah. yeah, the, the amount of information and to pass that exam, it's a, it's a whole thing for the listeners. If you don't know, it's not easy. Yeah. Well, one advantage I had was I, I had an, I had a client to practice on while I was doing it. So me. And so I, I trained myself and then I got those certifications and I had, I had zero intention of being a personal trainer. I had just done that to get what I it was ends to means, if you will. Right. And, and so what I did was I got through, and as you might imagine, if you lose 66 pounds of fat in, uh, in eight months, some people are going to notice. Uh, yeah. so one of my friends that actually did the warrior dash with me, we did it as a team. I come back, you know, eight months later and he sees a picture of me finishing that tough mutter. And he's like, okay, you got to give me what you got. How'd you do this? And I'm like, it's, it's not that hard, John. And he's like, well, you got to do it and tell me how you did it. And I'm like, okay, well, look, I'm, I'm starting. I decided I was going to start the podcast because still, even a year later, you know, when I'm, when people are asking all these questions, I'm like, there's still nothing out there. There, there's still no books. There's still no podcast, no podcasts. There's no, nothing. There's no one training people online. I'm like, this is just doesn't make any sense. So I said, okay. I said, John, I'll train you, but I want to train your wife too. If you'll, if the two of you will do that. He's like, yeah, absolutely. And I said, and I want to record it for my new podcast. He's like, okay. So if you go back to my podcast, the first, like, I don't know, several weeks of it, I can't listen to them because, you know, as a podcaster, you know this, you listen to your first few episodes, you're like, no, no, I got to delete those. I got to delete those. Um, I was terrible, but I, um, I did that. I, my training calls with them, I recorded them and they became part of the podcast. So you can see John and Tammy's journey. And in 10 weeks, John lost 39 pounds. Tammy lost 28. Okay. And then in Tammy's issue, she couldn't even train. Her back kept going out during that 10 weeks. So all of hers was nutritional coaching and had almost nothing to do with, with like working it off. Wow. And so I'm like, okay, at this point, I'm like, okay, I, I fixed myself. I'm, I'm, you know, when people listen and do what I asked them to do, then they fix themselves. And I'm like, and still nobody's doing anything about this. 
So I went in and said, okay, I'll just start coaching other people. Now, the intention was always to do that on the side. And at that point, I thought, you know, because this was 2015, almost 2016, I said, you know, I'll do this for about five years and then I'll retire. And then I'll, I'll do this on the side, I'll do this full time then. Uh, well, the company I was working for was going through rounds and rounds of layoffs every year layoff. They always announced it to me. They always called me and told me about it the week before Thanksgiving, that these folks need to be laid off before the end of the year. It's like you're walking to me like 25% of your staff needs to go December 31st. Tell us who it is. So I would spend Thanksgiving thinking about who I was going to let go. And I'd done that for like three years in a row. And so finally my name came up you know, the whole department at this point, they were outsourcing the whole department. They're like, mm -hmm. okay, we're going to cut your whole department. And I'm like, okay. So I went home and I told my wife, I'm like, I'm not going back. I don't like those people. I don't like the way they look at the world. I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to be like that anymore. I don't want to go back. And a big chunk of that was just this, this idea that I had worked so hard to improve my health, get myself to a point, but my stress level was still so high that I wasn't as healthy as I could be. I wasn't living life the way I should. I was, I was in, immersed in that stuff and it's, the stress level was just off the charts and it had been my whole career. But at this point I was like, you know, do I, do I have to do that? Well, cause and, it's kind of crazy. Cause you think about like, as you're on the come up in both position rank and whatnot, your body is coming up to <clears throat> weight wise and you're able to manage the stress less and then you get healthy and you can actually manage stress better. But it's interesting that you're like, you know, maybe it's not so much the stress, but the saying of if it's costing you your peace, then it costs too much because even though you can manage the stress better with a better physically capable body, it's there's something I find that when you become more accountable to yourself, whether it be in fitness or spiritually, however, sobriety, some people call it, that you kind of, you become more critical of the things outside your world that irritate you, bother you, or that's costing you your peace. Um, you become more strict on other people you're willing to tolerate less. And so yeah. I find it interesting that even though you could better handle the stress that your brain was still like, this is still too much, or I'm not happy, or this isn't my calling. Well, it, the point was it, it the way I kind of look at it is like, okay, what is my, what, what do I really want? And I want a long, healthy life. And I was like, is this serving that mission or not? And am I willing to take the paycheck for it? Not, you know, and, and, you know, when you're younger, sometimes you say, it's like, well, I gotta, I gotta get paid. Right. Um, but I was at a point in my life where I was like, you know, no, I'm not where I, I need to be to just stop working. I've got to make this fitness thing work. So it wasn't that I was, you know, by any means saying, okay, I don't need to do that. But I just, I said, no, I'm just going to try this thing. And, you know, even with that, and there's a lot of other things we'll get into that I've done, but I, now I make decisions very differently. It's not about, will this financially benefit me and my family? It's like, will this really serve my higher purpose of my life going forward? And it was not. So I walked away. I said, fine. I, you know, get laid off. And so for the first year, I sat down and wrote a book <laughs> called The Wellness Roadmap and published that November 2018. So, you know, get laid off in December of 2017 sit down and write the outline and then start hiring a, a writing coach and a editor and this, gosh, so many goddamn editors, <laughs> uh, because you know, it's like this editor, oh, well, I only do this, you yeah. know, and like, but I'm trying to write a whole book, not just that. And like, no, well then, then you got to get this editor, this editor over here. Well, they'll help you lay it out like a book. I'm like, oh, okay. And then this other editor here, when it's done, we'll make sure that it's a book. And I'm like, Okay. I don't, I, I really don't understand yeah. why it works that way, but yeah, I had like three editors and I hired a design team to do the cover and, you know, so, and, and I recorded the audio book myself. So that was where I went to oh, the side. Cool. Like, okay. I, I, I'm, I'm a podcaster. I'll, I'll read the book, 
So I, I put it all into a teleprompter and, and started reading, uh, learned a lot as I went through there. If you're going to write a book, read it out loud before you let it go to publishing final, because there's a lot of things that I had in the book that I wrote and I'm like, oh, it doesn't sound like me when I say it, you know? And I'm like, I rather this sound like me when I say it than the way I happen to want to write it, you know? Like, so anyway, I did do the audio book. So that, and it's all still out there on Amazon and Audible. So you can, you can find that if you're interested. It was really just a roadmap. And it's like, oh, well, this roadmap for how I went about doing my thing. And I've learned so much coaching since then that there's nothing in the rock book that's fundamentally wrong. But I, I did make some assumptions in the book that I'd be like, I would probably not make the same assumption today. Right. You know, generally it's not incorrect, but it's, it's not. You just, you're further correct. along. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so I wrote the book and then we, I published the book and then my wife and I are like, okay, look, where are we and what do we want to do? And, you know, cause we had a house on the beach and it was costing us a lot of money to own that house. And it was already paid for, but it was still a very expensive house uh, mm -hmm. just to own with the taxes and insurance and everything else. And so we said, well, what, what do we want to do? She says, well, I always thought I would just um, sell everything and, and move down to Key West. I said, well, well, Key West is pretty expensive too. She's like, yeah. I said, so what, what do you think about moving down the Caribbean? So we decided we were just going to go ahead and sell everything and move to a Caribbean island. And I told her I'd been through a place in Panama. And she says, well, I want to try Belize. So we, we checked them both out. And when we decided on Panama, so I, I live on an, I, we live on an Island in Boca del Toro, Panama. We have, a, we bought a, about two, three years ago, we bought a bed and breakfast. Uh, so it's a six bedroom bed and breakfast called Lula's uh, down here in Boca del Toro. This is a Caribbean Island that does not get hurricanes. Oh, wow. I didn't know the temperature that. never, the temperature never gets below 70 degrees and never gets above 90. Oh, you know, it's kind of humid, but again, it's for me, it's right Still in the though, sweet spot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So above, you know, not above 90. I mean, I'm here in Texas and, you know, reading the news this morning, they're already talking about the West Coast and the South, how we're going to already start hitting those record breaking temps. I'm like, oh boy, here yeah. we go. Another summer in hell. Yeah. Well, then, but, you know, and, and I'm in paradise. And, but again, that was another decision that was made. Okay, what would serve us best for my health and fitness and lifestyle and just everything else? And so, yeah, the the sell everything and move to a Caribbean island that you know, kind of the thing we talk about when we're in our twenties and thirties. We did just that. Did it. <laughs> did it. <laughs> so we moved here in two thousand nineteen, and we've been here ever since. Oh, that's cool. So you have the bed and breakfast. And you're still coaching, right? Yes. Okay. So it's kind of one of those things of you do multiple things, not just one thing. And yeah. most of those things are kind of entrepre entrepreneurial and kind of nourish your soul and your well-being, your higher purpose, more so than the C-suite trading your time for a paycheck. So yeah. it's kind of all together. And, and through this, though... I'm I'm guessing that as you've enacted some of these these measures that it fits into your coaching that you're able to talk about how potentially moving away and doing some of those things that some people consider scary how liberating it was for you and how much it's kind of reduced your overall stress yeah. and contributed to your well-being. So when you started off on this and you were training for that, what, and you wrote the book, what was kind of one of the things that you realized on approaching exercise and wellness as you got older, especially over the 40 range? Cause at 47, I maybe lift twice a week, maybe three times a week. I try to do some sort of movement every day. Not perfect. But, you know, I got a 10-year-old daughter. We have a 20-year-old and a 21-year-old. So for me, it's changed from, you know, dad bod, beach bod to I want to be healthy and I want to be around to see them grow old and, you know, do things with their life. So how did you approach it a little different, um, especially for the listeners? Because, I mean, primary age group is 28 to 44. 
for the listeners. So we are going to have quite a few in that 40 range, but also people who are going to be nearing that mark in that 35 range. So what are some things to think about and how do you approach that? Okay. Well, the first thing is this, is so many people look at exercise and think, you know, it's exercise and workout. And they're like, man, I hate that. I hate sweating. I hate going to the gym and, you know, this, you know, I have to, you know, people wear the gloves so they don't get the, yeah. the, the calluses on their hands. And, you know, they're like, I, I hate this. I just hate every minute of it. You know, they get on the elliptical, they hate every minute of it. And, and I just think that what they, what they're missing is purpose. Okay. They think they should do something. And that's why they push themselves to do something they don't want to do. But I think if you actually st- take a step back and the concept that I put forward is fit for task. Okay. So you have a 10 year old and the 10 year old gets into soccer mm-hmm. and wants to kick the ball around with you. You want to be able to go out there and kick the ball around. Okay. You've got kids in their twenties. Okay. Grandbabies. Do you want to be sitting in a rocking chair, looking down at the grandbabies on the floor playing, or would you like to get on the floor with them? Okay. Now I'll tell you this story. I, of course I was very fit at the time, but, um, my, when I met my wife and we got married, uh, her son had a daughter that was through marriage. Okay. So not technically a granddaughter, but a granddaughter. Right. Well, for one reason or another, this girl was terrified of me. Like she couldn't breathe around me. She was so afraid. Like, she wouldn't talk to me. She wouldn't look at me. She wouldn't even eat in front of me. It's like, she was just terrified. And I was like, I have to fix this relationship, but she's not going to listen to me. I can't just talk her into liking me. So I said, okay. So one day I'm sitting there and we were, we were in our, con- it was a condo at the time. And I was like, okay, I, um, I, I went ahead and said, I know what she likes. She likes SpongeBob. And so I'm going to take my laptop and I found a YouTube episode of SpongeBob and I walked over on the tile floor, plopped down, put the laptop in front of me and started watching SpongeBob. Okay. Now if you're in your mid forties and you go try to sit down on a tile floor, it's not comfortable. No, but if you have the fitness, you move around a bit, you get the mobility, you're moving around a bit and it, you know, it, it's not comfortable, but that's good. You're moving a little bit, but I sat down and we, she walked over and sat down right next to me and we watched an episode of SpongeBob. Now when that, they're only like 22 minutes, you know, so I'm not too, too long, but then I just turned to her and said, would you like, like to watch another one? And she said, yes, please. So the very first words that girl ever spoke to me was yes, please. So I turned it on to the next one and we watched another round of, of SpongeBob. Now only tell that story because yes, getting, if getting down on the floor is something that you're like, I don't know that I would want to do that on a tile floor, sitting on the tile floor for almost an hour. I don't know that that's something I'd want to do. It was the only way that I was going to have that kind of relationship with that girl. So if you understand the fundamental difference of you sitting in a rocking chair or chair, looking down at a kid versus getting down on the floor with them, the relationship difference is incredible. And, and, you know, as a father, we know that when we were little, when we were like younger, Mm-hmm. We had no problem getting on the floor. You know, my daughter and I used to play hallway football, you know, where I would toss the ball to her. She'd grab it and she'd start trying to run and I'd fake tackle her and then I'd get the ball and then she'd tackle me and, you know, being on the floor, rolling around. And I was, you know, we could all do that in our twenties. There's no reason we shouldn't still be doing it in our forties and fifties. Well, you know, what's interesting is that, you know, when, when you describe this fit for task type of thing. And I even kind of correlate it back to, let's say you're in the C-suite and you take two weeks vacation every year, even being fit for task. I mean, my mother and father-in-law just went on a 45 day trip to Europe on a cruise, all the walking, all the sightseeing, everything you do. It just amazes me that people kind of don't correlate like fit for task, even if the task is a vacation. Because why would you want to go on vacation and do not explore anything? I mean, why would you want to go to Rome and not see the Colosseum or something? Because you can't, because you're physically unable to. Like, it almost kind of doesn't make any sense that well the correlation's not there. Yeah. Well, I'll I'll take it a level deeper, and and this this is something that a lot think about a lot of people will kind of get is okay. 
Well, my, my grandfather didn't take care of himself physically. You know, he, he played golf and he loved golf and he lost golf because he couldn't do it. But the, the real crux of the story is this. When he turned 90, around the age of 90, he was living in an assisted care place, which means there are people local available. He was in his own apartment, but there are people available to come help him when he needed help. Okay. He couldn't make it from his chair to the bathroom in time and he couldn't physically clean himself up. So he would have to call them Man. when something happened. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to be able to wipe my own butt when I'm 105. Agreed. Okay. <laughs> you know, I want to be independent. If you if you can't open your own jar of pickles, you're not independent. Yeah, my wife, she can't... takes care of a 97-year-old guy who's, she does them like 10 hours a week and takes them to the bank and stuff. But at 97, he's he's still got it. Yeah. He's still independent. And, and, and that, but that's the point is, you know, if we don't take care of ourselves now, we're setting ourselves up for a lifestyle that sucks. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it just, it sucks. I mean, I can imagine how my grandfather, I didn't even get to see him the last five years. So when you talk about relationships and you talk about life, he, there's so much he missed the last five years of his life because the only person he really even allowed around him was my uncle, my uncle Charlie. He would, he would not let anyone else come visit him. He wouldn't leave his apartment. Yeah, okay. That's... And, and that's a sad one, but there's the other side of it. You know, if you've got a loved one that, you know, you're going to need to care for, you know, I have a wife, you know, and we're going to, we're going to live a long, healthy life together. But if she needed me to be able to pick her up and get her into a car to get her to the emergency room, guess what this guy's going to do? Well, pick her up and put her in a car and drive her to the emergency room. And so as you start looking at tasks and tasks are also joyful things, you enjoy, like my grandfather enjoyed playing golf. I wish he could have continued to play golf after the age of, of 80. I don't think he would have declined as fast if he were doing the things necessary to keep playing golf. If you like playing tennis, if you like doing certain things, you want to be able to keep doing them, but your body's going to age. And the only way you can keep doing them is to build strength and stamina and balance and agility. And you do that by training for it. So now you're not looking at it as exercise and working out. You're like, okay, I have to train. If I want to keep playing tennis, I have to train to be strong because I might fall. And if I have stronger bones and stronger muscles, they'll protect me from the fall. Especially if you have balance. My... Right. You work on your balance. That, that's a trainable physical capacity. And so you can train for better balance. You can train for strength and bone density. You can train for agility. So you're playing better longer. And, and so the things you love, you can keep doing. And yes, everybody will write the, the, the bucket list, but if you're not physically capable of fulfilling your bucket list, it will go undone. And so it's training to be fit for tasks. And if you'll think of it that way, it turns on a thing in your brain to say, okay, now I know why I'm doing this and therefore I'm going to do it. Yeah. Especially when you have, you know, so many people have this mindset. I don't know if it's been trained into us, but this idea of you go to work for all these years, you climb the corporate ladder and then you get the golden years and that's to do what you want. And I think the misnomer is, you know, there's a couple of them and it's like, you know, I thought I was going to be going for a director and VP. I thought that was the next best thing, but come to find out being laid off, starting a podcast and getting to spend all this time with my daughter was really the next best thing. Yes. And you know, so it, it's not an either or, but so many people trade out this idea of, hey, I'm going to work and then I'm going to have my golden years and that's when I'm going to go do all this fun stuff. Yet they're not physically capable of doing all the fun stuff for the golden years because they didn't take care of themselves. And, you know, for me, I found, I don't, I don't know, it, it's kind of hard to pinpoint just real quick, uh, after you're done listening to this amazing episode on this pretty freaking sweet podcast, give it a five-star rating, and then uh, head on over to the Podcast Connection Network and check out all the other amazing podcasts that we got over there. I This is this is a plug. I got I got one, too. It's called The Nonchalant Perfectionist. Check us all out. The link, you know where the link's going to be in the episode's description.
you know, I didn't take care of myself when I worked a corporate job. I don't really, I mean, I managed to lose weight here and there, but nothing substantial and nothing to keep it off. But, you know, I can definitely tell that that environment wasn't conducive to what I was wanting to accomplish. But with that being said, there's so many people out there who that that is their thing. And maybe they love their corporate job. And that's great if you have that. But, you know, kind of this understanding of everything is not really an either or option, that they're really yeah. kind of simultaneous options of you know, taking care of yourself. And that includes trying to find your purpose and what you love to do, because that's the thing that gives you that energy and that fulfillment in your soul. Because even like you said, even if you have that physical fitness, you can still end up at that job and go, ah, man, it's just too stressful. It's costing me my peace. And you know, the benefits don't outweigh the cost at some point. Um, people don't understand how impactful stress can be on your life. Um, yeah. And and that was the last thing. Like I had, I had improved my nutrition. I had improved my, uh, my training for physical. I had, I was sleeping well. I'd actually gotten to a point. I didn't even set an alarm at night. I, I, I would just wake up naturally because I knew that was a better way for me. I was going to bed at a regular time. I was waking up when I needed to. And I had taken care of every other aspect of my health and fitness other than the toxicity of my job and the stress. And then, yeah, whatever other toxins and whatnot the U.S. government allows them to put in our food and <laughs> um, products. But, uh, you know, everything else, it was like, okay, I'm, uh, if I have control over it, I'm doing it. But that was the one thing is with that job, I did not have control over the toxicity and, and the stress and so I was like, well, do I, do I really want to re-engage with that when I, I don't know that I have to? Now, do you define this? Because I know you wanted to make a shift and you made that conscious decision to make it. Did you ever label it, label it as self-love, self-care or anything like that? Or were you just kind of doing it and maybe learn that? this is what self-love is, is that taking care of yourself physically, spiritually? Well, it was, it was definitely about self-care, you know, because that was what I was, I was talking about on the podcast. You know, I'm like, you, mm -hmm. you've got to think about your health and fitness uh, with everything that you do. I, I could sit there and say, I, I, I'd love to go, um, you know, skiing, learn how to ski, but I, I generally know that, okay, I don't have the balance and the skills necessary. So if I got out there trying to ski, and I, and I injured myself, what would that put me back? So is, is the experience of learning to ski worth trying, you know, the risk of injury? And I, at, the, at my, this point in my life, the answer is no. Another thing I did at, at the age of 51, decided I wanted to get as strong as I could physically get. It was just a personal challenge to myself because I'm a high challenge person. And I did. I was, I was literally at age 51 stronger than I'd ever been in my entire life. And that included when I was an offensive lineman in high school. So I, I got myself really, really strong. So here I am training one day and um, it's, I've got 85 pound dumbbells and it's a seated military press. Now, I don't know why my brain didn't understand this and why I did it the way I did it, but I, I should have gotten the weights up before I sat down. I should have done a power clean, clean movement to get the weights up, use your hips, get the weight up. I didn't. I just thought I would just swing them up there. Well, my shoulder thought something different. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so I tore, I tore a rotator cuff and I knew the instant I did it, what I had done, I knew it was a complete tear. There was no doubt in my head that that's exactly what I just done. And so I was like, okay, well, do I, do I ever physically need to be able to lift 170 pounds over my head? What, what, what circumstance could I think of where I would ever need to do that. And so now when I train, it's a very different type of training. It's like, okay, what's the, you know, what's the heaviest thing I think I'll have to press over my head. It, well, it's, it's a carry on it. You know, I got to put in the overhead bin. It's maybe a box that I've got to put, you know, up in a, in a up in the, uh, it's not really an attic, but there's a space mm -hmm. and I'm, it's like, I need to put that over my head. That's never going to weigh more than 40 pounds, or I'll put it in two boxes instead of one. 
you know? Um, so it's just in that thought of, okay, what do I need to be able to do and what can I do? And I don't need to be exceptionally stronger, fitter in any other dimension. It's just, that's what I need to train for. So I don't, I don't train as heavy as I used to. And and, that, and I'm cool with that. You know, that, that's, that's an ego check as a guy. That's a huge yes. ego check. Cause I remember I was in CrossFit and I was like, of all the things these guys were doing in CrossFit, cause I was in my fifties. I'm like, I wish I could keep up with them. You know, I want to keep up with these guys cause I'm watching them do this stuff. There was only one thing that I was better than those kids at, and that was the deadlift. And so one day they coded, you know, we want you to do, start at 60% of your one rep max, and then we want you to work up. We're doing three sets of three, but they wanted to start at 60% of one rep max and then work up this percentage as you go. Well, they were all grabbing, all the other people were grabbing the tens and fives. So I couldn't, there were no tens and fives left. So I'm going up an increments of 50 pounds. Mm. <laughs> Okay. So I get through with, I get through and I did a set of, I did a set of three at more than my one rep max. And I was, I was pretty darn happy with myself at that point. And so now they're going to do the Metcon and I look over at the Metcon and the Metcon is hang cleans, 400 meter run and toast bar. And my, my, my whole posterior chain was just toast. And so my form on all of that was just crap. And so I did two rounds of it and my lower back just went and said, no, you're done. And I couldn't finish the workout. And so I, was, so I went from this elation of, of success and ego into you idiot. <laughs> what did you do? Yeah. And then I had walked the mile to the gym, to the box. So I had to walk a mile home in that kind of pain. And I was like, okay, never again, you know, never again do I, and that, you know, did I? Yeah, that's when I tore I tore my shoulder. Do you uh, find that women out. have less ego than men when training? Um, they can. It just depends on the woman. I I think men in general, particularly particularly those of us who have been athletes in the past, <laughs> had that tendency to look back. You know, the windshield. Oh, I used to be that. I think women do it more on the size, the dress that they used to wear, and right. you know how cute they were, and. Things. So it's a little different. If they were an athlete in school, then there's potential that they may be like, you know, I used to be fast. I used to be strong. I used to be able to do this. But for the most part, yeah, it's, I, I'm not going to say it's entirely a male thing, but definitely more male than female. And it's, it's ego. It's it's all ego. So Yeah, because I try to think about that whole, like, like you said, like, there's this thing of wanting to get stronger, because I think as men, that's how we, we measure our progress is the strength. But then, you know, what you had said about when am I ever going to need to lift 160 pounds over my head? Well, probably never. So, yeah. so why are you doing it? And that really resonates with me at 47 going to the gym. And, you know, I start off with a um, less weight, higher rep, and then go up and weight lower reps by the third and fourth set. But there is this whole thing that I never really kind of thought of going, how do you know to test where you're at until it's too much other than, you know, I had it happen to me doing a rotary calf machine and had my headphones on with music and could hear the snap as I was doing the calf raises. And, you know, that took forever to heal. And then yeah. walking with the limp, then, you know, you do that for months, walking sideways, then your gates off, then your hips are off. And it, it was just a hot mess. And it was like, you know, kind of like you said, well, why, why did I need more than my body weight on my calves? When is that ever going to happen? And it, it was just, you know, you look back and kind of it undoes some of the potential progress you would have, because now I couldn't do legs. Now I couldn't do cardio for probably 90 days. I'm guessing it, it took a little while to yeah. work out, you know, but, um, very, very insightful. Now I had a question from either an episode I listened to or through the pod match thing that said, what was the most in single, most important weight loss secret you've learned through the over 300 author interviews? Yeah. So I, at this point, I probably interviewed about 400 people. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. And I would say probably two thirds of them are, are definitely in the, the weight loss category, diet and diet and, and weight loss. And so I've had, I've had, you know, vegans on mm -hmm. like Dr. Gregor. I've had carnivores on, I've had vegan keto. I've had keto. I've had dash diet. I've had Mediterranean, you know, all, what, whatever people are eating. I even had raw paleo. So a person who just basically didn't cook anything, including mm -hmm. eggs. Um, mm -hmm. I've had them all on. And they all will say, my way of eating is superior. Okay, da, da, da. I've got science on my side. And I'm like, okay, so let's dive into why that's the case. Okay. And they'll say, well, it's a whole food and they eat junk. That's, that's the answer. I eat whole food and they eat junk. So if it's a vegan, it's like, well, they eat all that processed meat and all that, you know, stuff. If it's a carnivore, it's like, well, they're eating cookies. And, you know, did you know M&Ms are vegetarian? <laughs> so, you know, you're, you're going through all this and you're like, okay. And then you know, some of the science, you look at where it came from and it's like, well, I can understand why they said that and why they would say that. I went to Italy and I can tell you they eat red meat. I'm sorry. The, the, you know, Mediterranean diet isn't exactly what they say it is. So I'm like, what is the, what is the core thing when I sit down and lay it all together? And that was the answer. We eat whole food. It's, it's, it's just that it's food. It's what our ancestors would have recognized as food. And that's what they would have eaten, which meant it was from a plant or an animal and it's recognizable in that form. Okay. So while plant stuff goes into a Twinkie and animal stuff goes into a Twinkie, it's neither plant nor animal at right. this point. It's a refined processed thing. It's not real food. So if it's in a bag box, jar, or can, it should be suspect. If it's in either of those forms and you look at the ingredients list and there's more than two, you probably shouldn't be eating it. If it has an ingredient that you can't pronounce, you definitely should not be eating it. <laughs> okay. Um, and that's what's happened is they've turned us into food like substances. The problem is with most of these is they're, they're nutrient poor and calorie dense, meaning you're not getting what your body needs, but you're getting the calories it needs. Now our body has this really good feedback mechanism when it's not getting what it wants. It asks for more and it's saying, I need more when it means nutrition. <laughs> and we're hearing more Twinkies. <laughs> Yeah. And we're eating like more I, calories. Yeah. I feel like I heard that on a podcast. What somebody said recently that, you know, the biggest difference was nutrients. What your body yeah. needs is nutrients. It's not this, that, you know, you can break it down to sim simplicity, but he goes, it's the nutrients. And therefore you should be looking for nutrient rich foods. Right. And so it's the fundamental difference between um, olive oil or avocado oil and vegetable oil. These are providing me with nutrients, avocados and, and the way they're, they're, they're cold pressed to get the oil mm -hmm. very different than the way a seed oil is made with chemicals and processing and heat and all that stuff that strips everything out of it. Um, having a whole grain is probably fine for you, but when they strip all of it down and make it a white rice, it's basically sugar. You know, and so as you kind of start looking at what real food is, when you eat more of that, meaning, okay, chicken breast with mm -hmm. the skin on it, there's nothing wrong with the skin. If the chicken's taken care of, it's a healthy animal, eat the whole damn thing, you know, boil the bones, make broth, eat the whole animal, eat the whole vegetable. And so I, I just think that's the principles people get into this um, paradigm of, well, I'm the vegan guy. So now mm -hmm. I have to talk about vegan. And so when someone, when someone puts themselves out there as a, a, a brand and a thing, well, they can never question that. So a scientist that believes in the vegan diet will always find the vegan diet better, argue away other facts for the sake of the other. So I was talking to a vegan and I asked him, I said, okay, well, what about B12? He says, well, 
yeah, of course we have to supplement with B12, but carnivore, you know, uh, omnivores, people who eat red meat have to supplement with statins. And that was his answer. That was mm. his answer to that question. And I'm like, well, no, <laughs> you need B12 to survive. You don't need statins to survive. We're, I wouldn't we're consider not, stat- no, statins a there, supplement. There's no statin deficiency. Um, and so, you know, it, but that was, he had put that in his head because that's how he solved that math problem. That was a paradox. And he had to solve the paradox because he was on one side of this. And I'll say, eat what you like to eat, but make it whole food. How is it different down where you're living now versus when you were in the US? How differences in food, packaged foods, grocery stores? Real food here is very inexpensive. <laughs> I can I can get a dozen eggs for two dollars and twenty five cents, and these these eggs are 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 chickens are just pasture chickens. They're in one case the the actual grocery store owned the chickens. Oh, cool! And they, right, you walk over across the street and see the chickens. Now that they they couldn't I they t- didn't bother with the whole idea of, of it being organic or not. You walk across the street and you see the chickens. They look like right. healthy chickens, unlike in a processed food environment where they have all these chickens and they're literally like chained to their pen to just drop eggs. This wasn't like that. When they sell eggs here, they, they don't clean the the film off of it. So, you know, an egg does not have to be refrigerated here because there's a, there's a natural film around the outside of the egg. If you wash the egg, you wash that film off, it can go bad. But in general, no, we receive our eggs. They've never been refrigerated and they're fine. So, you know, again, when I look at at that, I'm like, okay, th- this is, this is they're healthy animals. I literally watched them carry the carcass, uh, half of a carcass of a cow into a grocery store one time. We lived across the street and it was COVID times. And so I had nothing else to do but sit there and just watch people on the street it wasn't my hours to be out, so I couldn't be out, but I just watch. And every, you know, every Tuesday morning, the, the, the produce truck would come in from the mainland. They'd have the carcass of a cow and a little kid, you know, he's, he's as big as him. And he's throwing over his shoulder and carrying it into the grocery store. So the, the, the meat and produce and, and eggs and things that we get here are, are a thousand fold better than what you can get in the United States for the same price. If you want to eat like an American here, you can. So if you... Someone will probably be able to sell you hamburger helper if you really, really just wanted it. So there is stuff, you know, if you want the, the, the stuff it's here and it costs about the same as it would meet in the United States. So again, it could be expensive to live here and, and eat here, but if you eat normal food, uh, it's not expensive at all. Now, how is the, um, just out of curiosity, how's the, um, what does body composition look like there? Maybe by compared to the U S more obese well, people, less obese people. Oh, less. Uh, uh, well, uh, out of the local population, a lot less. And the, and the principle is this: they they don't have the money to be buying the sodas and candies and crisps and crackers and chips and biscuits right. and everything else. They're 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 basically eating real food. Um, now there are some, yes, they do eat more of that stuff. They've got a little bit more disposable income. And they tend to eat more like a Westerner. And as a result, yes, there, there still is obesity and, and that type of thing. But I would, I would call that almost like a, you know, that person's basically their family's pretty well off because they're able to eat that way. Whereas most of them are not. And so most of them are not that overweight and they, they walk a lot more. They ride their bikes a lot more. Uh, Most of them don't own cars. So, and we live on an Island. You don't need to have a car, but right. This is most a whole the, different lifestyle in a way. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. It was kind of like the, most of the folks that, that immigrated here that like to call themselves expats, um, they they do have cars. And so you're more likely to see overweight Americans, Canadians, and people from the UK. The locals, they tend to be normal weight, healthy. With this journey that we've kind of discussed of how you got to where you are, the next part I kind of want to discuss is your fulfillment from where you were and where you are like what's what's making you happy these days what what stresses you out and how do you deal with the stress and how is it different than 
your old life when everything kind of stressed you out? Okay. So the one thing is I'll, I'll, I would never go back. So I'll just, I'll just make that statement. The decisions I made, when you make the decision for the better of yourself, you'll, you'll never question that decision. I made the right, we, we've made the right decisions so far, as far as being here and doing this, doing what I'm doing with the coaching, this pod, my podcast, being on your podcast, I'll, I'll never question that in a minute. I'm helping people and I love doing that. In my prior job, I did feel like I was helping people because I was helping the company. Right. I was keeping people from, from committing fraud. I was finding the frauds. And so, yes, I, I was in making companies better, making them better controlled um, and making them do what they say they do. So I felt really good about that. And then when you realize, okay, well, it's pension funds, 401ks and things like that, that invest in these kind of companies, it makes everybody better. It helps everybody. Right. Okay. So in that sense, I, I felt really good about what I did. There was, there was, there was a satisfaction to being really good at what I did, but it was a constant battle and fight. It's not nice. You know, no one likes the auditor, but in some of the companies I worked for, they hated me. I was the most hated man in the company. In fact, it was a joke. It was a running joke with my boss. There was one year he says, well, you just got voted out. You're not the most hated guy. There's one guy it was when we implemented ERM enterprise risk management. And so they brought in a guy and they, they had him doing enterprise risk management and then officially everybody hated him more than me. And, and so that was, but that was just the joke is like, you know, I was, I was it, I was the guy they hated. And I, you know, it, because that was my job, I, I accepted that I accepted. Okay. No one wants me there. When I show up there, probably not a good thing. And unless they invited me, which sometimes people did, they're like, okay, I don't want to fill an audit. I said, okay, well, I'll go out and pre-audit you. And then that's just a management report. And then you won't fail the audit. And I'm like, oh, you'll do that? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. I'll do a pre-audit. Just tell me when you want me to come out. And, and that worked. I always worked very well. Uh, so there was some I had really good relationship with at work, but a lot I did not. Now, when I help someone, it's, it's this direct, I see them. So a woman who truly believes she cannot lose weight, she's over 50, she's in menopause, truly believes she cannot lose weight, needs to lose over 40 pounds, and she does it. A man who needs to lose weight, uh, wants to get more fit, or another man, I had another man, he wanted, he, all of his friends that he liked to bike, he, he was on a bicycle, he loved his bicycle, loved bicycle riding. And like, they weren't doing little things. Like they, they were going to go on this big race. It was like 140 miles and it was straight out. There was no out and back. It was out. And he said, okay, so this is 140 miles. I need to be ready for it. And, um, I said, well, I'm not a biking coach. He's like, no, no. If I lose 15 pounds, I know I can do this. I'm like, okay, so I'll coach you. So we got him and he lost the 15 pounds, worked on the power in his legs, because he didn't just want to do the race. It's similar to the conversation I had with my daughter. I wanted to be in her race, which if you're in cycling, sometimes you have to take the lead. Mm -hmm. You know, this was a group. They're all a little younger. He's all about 10 years younger than him. He said, they will leave me. Like they won't slow down to let me stay with them. They will just leave. Now they'll send a the car back that, you know, then I got to live with it. That oh, I yeah. didn't the race. And so he's like, I have to stick with them, but I don't just want to stick. I have to take my lead when it's my turn. They need to be able to draft off of me, just like I've drafted off of them. I'm like, cool. So we got him to that point. And so when you see someone do that, you know, they do their first half marathon, they lose 25 pounds. They, you know, they tell me, it's like, I was doing this, pre the they hired me. He's like, he says, I just did this presentation I had to do. He says, I couldn't button the neck on my shirt. So I had to tie my tie and I couldn't button my neck you know, on my shirt. Oh yeah. That's a hard one right there when it, it is. And so he's like, you know, he works with me for 12 weeks and he's like, he's like, I'm wearing the suit and the shirt. And he's like, it looks good. I feel really good in this suit now because I can button the neck and it's comfortable. And so it's just those moments that, that just lights me up because it's not the 40 pounds. It's not the bike ride. It's the life. It's the experience. It's the, who they are now and how they feel about themselves and the confidence and the capacity and the dreams of what they know they can do now. It's like, you did this hard thing. Look at what you can do. You can do anything if you set your mind to it. 
So I get to do that every single day. Yeah. Who wouldn't want that? <laughs> yeah, it, it makes me think of my situation at 47, falling into this after being in corporate. And, you know, it's like one of those things of going, man, the only regret is maybe you wish you'd done it sooner. But the thing was, is all the pieces weren't really in place to have done it sooner. You know, you wouldn't have necessarily maybe had the appreciation, gratitude, and or just that commitment to make it happen sooner. And you may not have had that kind of never go back attitude of once you made up your mind, this is the way we're going and we're not going back. So yeah, that, that definitely kind of resonates. Well, with me. I, I actually did. I, I actually would have done it earlier. Uh, in fact, you know, I told you we were going through rounds of layoffs the years uh -huh. before the year before they outsourced my entire department. I, I put my name on the list. They didn't and give my it boss to you. Told me, my boss told me to take my name off the list, that that was not going to happen. Wow. And, and, and so I had to pick someone else. And then, yeah, a year later when it was my name, when it was like everybody, I was like, okay. That's kind of, so, you know, I mean, <laughs> I know like I wasn't happy at my corporate job and I had looked at other corporate jobs, like really, that's a dumb idea, but the uh, the point was was that if I hadn't gotten laid off, I don't know that I ever would have had the strength maybe to just leave and try something else. You know, it was kind of yeah. what I'm doing was kind well, of well. Well, there's a little bit of headspace. There's a little bit of headspace there because realize that I was not 47. I I was I was in my early 50s. Mm. Okay, so that was a fundamental difference. Is that I was in my 50s, I had already pretty much set in my head a five-year plan that I was already kind of almost two years into. And so I'm like, okay, am I going to, because what I was looking at was, okay, I got laid off three years before I, mm -hmm. I wanted to end this. And so, but I knew because uh, the transition to another job with bonuses, investing and all the crap, mm -hmm. I'm like, this doesn't become a three-year thing. This this is me about signing up for about another five-year thing to to make this what it was maybe going to be. And I'm like, so do you know? Because it was so it was not three years. I'm signing on for three years. This is like I have to sign on for probably five years to make this pay. And so at that point, it was like like when I got laid off, it was a no-brainer. And that's why I say the year before, I was like, okay, I'm a year into my plan. I'm coaching people online. I could do this. How did you keep and, up that motivation during some of the times it dipped? Because people would look and go, oh, five years, that's a long time to look for payoff. And that's a long, that's a long time to allow for dips in motivation. So how do you keep yourself fired up and kind of on, on the path and stick to it when things go a little wonky? Because, you know, there's always that option of you have that experience and you can always go back. Yeah. And, and I could, I mean, I literally, I could, I could sit down tomorrow and start making some phone calls and probably have some interviews lined up within about the next month. Not going to do that. Uh, but I could. And I think that was the whole point. It's like, it's not like I'm out there burning bridges and, and pissing people off and saying, no, I, I, I was just like, no, I'll, I'll do my job. I'll do my job till the tell, day you tell me not to. Now I was very clear, uh, as I was going through that round and round of layoffs, I was like, okay, look, I, um, if, if you are having me lay these people off, you're going to get a reduced service out of my unit. I'm not going to work my people to the bone to give you what you've gotten if you're not going to let us have the resources to do it. And so I even told him that. I'm like, when you call us up and you want us to, someone to do a due diligence piece, we'll have to say no. And that's a very expensive engagement when you try to outsource it and they want it done in 72 hours. I'm like, you're going to hire a firm and you're going to pay them a boatload of money to be on retainer to do what you need them to do that we were doing for free. And so I said, if you take the people, the level of service will go down. I will say no when your managers come to me and ask me for anything because I have my mission it's written into law and Toronto has to do a certain thing. I report to an audit committee 
And so if you come to me and say, I want, I need you to do this due diligence work before we would have guys, we'd have guys on the ground within 72 hours flying in from wherever to get the work done. And it was a very exclusive, very hard to do work in places you don't necessarily want to go. But I had people that could do that. I could do that. And I said, but I'm not going to, and I'm not going to make my people work that much harder to serve your people. They can hire it out. I don't care. It's going to cost you a lot more than those three people do. Yeah. But they want me to cut three people. So I cut the three people. And and then when they rolled around, someone says, well, we got this. I said, no. I said, go talk to Roger. I told him no. I sat in his office when he told me he wanted to do this. He told me I had to cut three people. Put my name on the I didn't tell anybody. It's the company. If there was anybody's listening mm-hmm. to this, yes, I did put my name on the list the year before audit got squashed, but I just basically said, you know, I, I can't deliver the level of service that I've been delivering with that few people. Cause you know, cutting 12 to nine, you know, you can imagine if you went out there and you were like, okay, just 11 and nine. Think, think about going out on a football field and just saying, well, we're just going to leave two of our guys off the field and still try to score a touchdown. Yeah. <laughs> Not going to happen. Okay. And, and so it was just one of those things. I can't perform at that level, and and so that was that was a mental switch for me that year. And I was like, okay, if they're going to make me do this, and then they're not going to let me put my name on the list, then you know it is. I'm not going to kill myself for this company. I'm going to work and get done what needs to get done, no more and no less. So it did change my motivation for that particular company. I'm just not going to do it again. I'd, I'd done it in other companies as I was working my way up the career. But I'm like, there's no upside right now. There's no upside for me killing myself doing a job that is unappreciated. Now, do you feel that so what you're doing now is appreciated? Do you get that? Like whether it's working kind of for yourself, everything you do is for the customer and yourself. Do you get that kind of, what do you call it? Like a, almost like you trust your own intuition, but you're not going to trust a company to make decisions for you of what they think is best for you. Right. I, <clears throat> I make every, well, my wife does, my wife makes every decision. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. But um, yeah, no, I don't, I don't do what I don't want to do. You know, when it, when it comes to a client, whether I accept the client or not is, is really on the basis of, can I help them? And then, yeah, the, the lesser bit is, do I want to, I had one, one woman come to me, and she's like, I need to lose 70 pounds. I'm like, okay, well, let's have that conversation. So we start having the conversation. I'm like, so this is something you really need to do now. And she said, well, absolutely. I'm like, okay, so tell me what's going on. She says, well, my daughter's getting married in two months and I need to lose 70 pounds. Yeah. And I'm like, well, I could probably help you lose 70 pounds in two months. If I'm honest with you, you won't like it. You probably won't do it. And as soon as that wedding's over, you're going to go back to doing what you did before. You're going to gain it all back and more. So I, I don't want to do that. That's not what I do. So now if you're serious about losing the 70 pounds and keeping it off, it's not going to happen in two months, but I'd be happy to talk to you. So like, no, I, I need to lose the 70 pounds in two months. I'm not your coach. Do you restrict your coaching to 40 plus or do you coach people below 40? Uh, 40 plus. If you were here, if you were here in Bocas del Toro and you wanted to do some strength training, I'd, I'd probably honor that and let you come on in and, and I would train you in my studio because I've got a studio there at Lula's too. So if you came in and said, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be here for a couple months and I, I want to train and I want to coach, I, I would, I would train you. But outside of, of Bocas, no. <laughs> so you do mostly bed and breakfast, then you have a studio for training. Do any people ever kind of combine the endeavors and say, hey, I want to come down, do a little one-on-one coaching with you, and I can stay here while I do it? Do you have any situations? Uh, like if that? someone wants to do that, we're, we're game. Uh, no one's ever really pursued it that way. Um, I've had a lot of people that, you know, from my podcast and others that I've been on, like, oh, I'd love to come down there. But that's the same, in many cases, the same sentiment of I'd love to sell everything and just move to a Caribbean island. Um, it just never happens. So if someone does want to come down and they're like, hey, I know you're a trainer and I want to get stronger. So I'm going to come down and stay. Yeah, we'd have a conversation about that for sure. It just hasn't happened. Now, I've trained people locally and I enjoy doing that occasionally. It's just, you know, it, you're dealing with a local economy, local rates, local pricing. 
And so it's just, it's not financially feasible for me to survive working as a local personal trainer. It just, it just isn't, no one's going to, people here aren't willing to pay what's necessary to, for me to pay my bills. So I train online. I focus on 40 plus because the movement patterns, the injuries, the things we've dealt with at that point are very distinct from a 20 year old or a 30 year old. And, and there's a mindset thing too. There's a point where you're realizing, okay, I'm, I'm crossing into another phase of my life. And so I'm there. We're there. One, they're more serious <laughs> Two, they'll, and it's not that they're doing more, but they'll, they're working harder and they will work harder because the, the new phase scares us. Getting older doesn't scare us when we're in our 20s because we expect to die in our 30s. But then we get past the 30s and we're now in our 40s. And it's like, crap, I didn't die in my 30s. Now what? Um, <laughs> I know. I thought I was going to go before 38 or 39 and I'm going to be 48 this month. And I'm like, oh boy. Right. Well, happy birthday. But uh, <laughs> you know, but that's the whole point. The whole point is we're like, yeah, when we get past the 30s, we're like, crap, I didn't die young. Uh, now what am I going to do? Like, well, I guess I got to start taking care of myself. So, you know, I'm going to start, yeah. I'm going to buy a juicer and, you know, I'm going to start drinking these shakes and uh, all this stuff. And so it was like, it's like, no, it's, um, it is a new phase. It's a new mindset and we've got to be careful because we could really wreck ourselves and an injury when you're over forties is no joke. Uh, it takes longer to recover. And so that's why I want to train people at that age, because the, the mindset's different, the approach is different. And if I can get them stronger and help them lose weight, uh, the reward is actually even bigger because someone in their thirties loses 20 pounds. Like, yeah, well, I've done that before. And so I'll probably gain it all back and then we can try this again next year. But someone who's in their forties changes their life. Most of the time they're going to stick with it and keep going. Yeah. Cause I'm like, I, my wife and I've been together 18 years. I haven't been this weight since I met her in 2006 and I'm actually below the weight when we met in 2006. So I haven't been this weight since 2005. So yeah. it definitely takes on a different kind of mindset outlook, what you're going for, because, you know, I, in my thirties and early forties, I like you kind of tried and felt like I was dragging on the bottom of the ocean there for a little bit. And, you know, I don't even know where or what made it click, but I just started with consistency and started off small. And I figured as long as I could start off small and remain consistent, then eventually it would happen. And I just started changing little things, kind of like you said, trying to eat more whole foods. You know, I'm not perfect, but just trying to do a more conscious approach of small baby steps in a certain direction, doing more things right than wrong. And it's consistency is consistency is 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 the prime principle. If you could be consistent and do a little bit better over over time, yes, that's that's how you get there. My New Year's resolution um, wasn't an actual thing of like, I'm going to lose weight. My new year's resolution was the word consistency. And that was to remain consistent with a little bit of fitness, the podcast that would yield the results. But before we wrap up, can we let everybody know where they can find you? I know you mentioned you had some books on Amazon. And yeah, I've got, I've got a book on Amazon. It's called the wellness roadmap. It's also an audio book. So you're, you're listening to a podcast. I assume you like to this, this form of oh, yeah. content. So you did, I did do, I did do it in audio book. It's about five and a half hours. So uh, not, not too bad. It comes with a workbook. So this it's, it is, it is intended to be a manual, something to help you really fix yourself. Uh, and in that book, I would say you don't have to be over 40 to get the benefits from that book. It's, um, so that's, I wrote it. I wrote it a little bit more generic than that. I have the podcast 40 plus fitness that's available wherever you listen to podcasts. It is the oldest and largest podcast for people over the age of 40 in the health and fitness field. Um, I launched it in 2015 episode 645 went live Congrats. this week that we're recording this. Uh, so the fellow podcaster is going to know what that means. A lot. Uh, that's, con that's consistency, by the way. <laughs> yes. And yes. Then, and then, and then, yes, I've been coaching online. Uh, you can find me at 40 plus fitness.com. That's four zero P L U S F I T N E S S.com. 
Uh, and that's where you can find access yet yeah, to the book, to the podcast and to all the different training programs and things that I do. And yeah, there's a quiz on there that you can take. If you want to learn a, bit, a little bit more about your mindset, uh, you can reach out to me if you're considering hiring a coach. And I'll just say, you, you, know, you don't have to be 40 to get started. <laughs> Please don't wait till your 40s. So if you're in your 20s and you listen through all this, thank you. If you're in your tw- 30s and listen through all this, you're seeing something that's in front of you. This is your opportunity. So 20s, 30s, 40s or beyond, this is your opportunity. Do something today, get started and just consistent little steps. Like you said, Richard, it's just consistent little steps are going to get you there. Yeah, agreed. Because man, if I could have gotten a hold of this much sooner, but I didn't. Everything comes along as it needs to, as it should be. So if you're out there and you feel bad, feel bad for Don't. just a little bit. <laughs> Yeah. Just a little like bit I, of guilt. I, you know, I, the, but... I, 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 you know, he was, we were talking before we got on here. I was like, well, what was your rock bottom? And I'm like, I just got drug across the bottom of the ocean for nine years, eight years. Uh, that's what my rock bottom was. It just, I found the bottom and just stayed there. And so there wasn't a rock bottom. There was the bottom of the ocean dragging uh, that, that happened. And, and that's, that's the truth of it. But you, can make that commitment to change and a commitment is emotional and it's deep. You've got a compelling why, you know where you're going. When you put that together and you make that commitment, you'll do hard things. When you do hard things, you get great results because nothing great in your life ever happened in your comfort zone. Everything great in your life happened because you took a step, even a little step outside your comfort zone. And that's where the good stuff is. That's where the growth is. That's where improvement is. That's where the magic is. So make the commitment and take that baby step outside your comfort zone and good things will happen for you. And what does your daughter think about as she looks back on all this and goes from watching her do a CrossFit thing to seeing you now and having gone through all that, what's, what's her perspective? Well, how do y'all get along? Yeah, we get along great. You know, there are three points in my daughter's life that are like magic in my brain. Okay. One, one is the day she was born and this was in 1992. Um, so the, I'm that old. I graduated in 93. (laughs) Yeah. So I had a daughter at 92 when she was born, uh, they took her out, they were doing some tests and I reached down, she wrapped her hand around my pinky. Okay. And then, and then the second one would, I'd be walking her down the aisle just about a year and a half ago, which I am, determined to, I know 100%, if I had not done what I did in my mid forties, I probably wouldn't have been alive for that. Oh. And then yes, crossing that finish line at the tough mutter, holding her hand. Those are moments that you'll, you'll, you'll never lose. You know, no one can take that. They could take my money. They could take my house. They could take everything else away, but they cannot take that. And so, yes, my hopes are yes, that my daughter sees that I didn't always live my life the way I was supposed to, but when it mattered, I was there. Oh, I love that. And I especially love as a father myself. Um, I love that it was kind of tied to making that happen and doing that tough mutter with her, um, as opposed to being a spectator. And, you know, I think, like you said, that's kind of important because you've been able to express what it means to you to have been able to, um, hold her hand and cross that finish line and walk her down the aisle. But there's one day that you'll be gone and she'll have that memory because of what you did and what it means to her. And, you know, I would suggest any fathers out there listening, um, we need to love ourselves in order to get our self love and self care under control. And so I would say, you know, not necessarily doing it for your kids specifically, but kind of like you said, in order to be able to do that so you can walk alongside of them and with them and kind of live life together as that's kind of what it's intended to be when you're family. Yeah, 100%. Well, anyways, thank you for your time. It was great chatting with you. And I hope that the listeners go out there, especially the ones over 40 and the late thirties go out there and hit you up, give your podcast a listen and start thinking about walking down that road and where they want to be 10 years from now, because we're not 20 anymore and we're not going to die before we're 40. (laughs) So we got to, we got to start thinking about what we're going to do, but 
Um, do you have any questions for me? No, no. I, I just really appreciate the opportunity to have this conversation. And if there's anything I can ever do to help you grow your bit, you know, grow your line, what you're doing, because you're doing some great stuff here. Uh, just let me know. I will. I will definitely. And, you know, it's great to be able to talk to you as well and learn to be able to absorb the information of one, somebody who's got over 600 episodes under the belt. And then two, being older than me and the fitness part of it. And I definitely understand the C-suite mentality and whatnot. And so it, it's it been eye-opening and a pleasure. And it definitely gives me hope. I feel like I'm headed in the right direction. So you are. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for your time. Well, that's a wrap. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from. Remember, go out and be the person that you want to meet. Asteroid of fear.